Is anything happening, Liam? Yeah, I've sent us live. I'm just waiting for the stream to load. OK, thank you. Oh, yeah, the the feed is now live. Thank you. Sorry about the delay. No problem. Thank you very much. So I can confirm we're now live. Thank you. Thanks. Um, good afternoon, members, councillors, and any members of the public who may be joining us this evening for this meeting of the Scrutiny and Review Committee of South Cambridgeshire District. My name is, is Councillor Grenville Chamberlain and I am the Chair of the Scrutiny and Review Committee. I'd like to start with a, just a few points of housekeeping, if I may, please. So can you please make sure your device is fully charged or charging. Please switch off the microphone unless speak and when you have finished speaking please turn off your microphone immediately it's, it's, it's slowly clearly do not talk or interrupt anyone and if you wish to speak on an item please indicate this using the chat function which the vice chair will be managing for me but please do not use the chat for anything else at present online with me are the following members of the Scrutiny and Overview Committee who I will shortly invite to introduce themselves. Members, after I call your name, please turn on your microphone and introduce yourself so that we may note your presence. Please remember to turn your microphone off. Chair, I can't hear you. Chair, I think it's Councillor Cathcart's mm. microphone is cutting in. Councillor Cathcart, are you on mute? It is mute. It's showing as mute. Is that any? Can you it's hear? Better, me? It's, it's better once it's on mute. It hasn't been on mute. Hi, Chair. It's uh, Liam, the producer here. Um, just as a comment on the audio quality, uh, the, your microphone on your system isn't kind of coming out very well. It's quite quiet. If you know where it is on your computer, if you just try sort of talk into it, like in the direction of it a little more, then then it would result in sound. Uh, thanks. I will put it right in front of me because it isn't yeah. direct. There you go. That's much better. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Uh, so could I firstly invite Councillor Anna Bradnam to introduce herself, please? Good evening, I'm Councillor Anna Bradnam and I'm the member from one of the members for Milton and Waterbeach. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Councillor Nigel Cathcart. Thank you, I'm uh, Nigel Cathcart. I'm the, uh, the member for Bassingbourne and Lettlington. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Sarah Chung-Johnson. Hi, I'm Councillor Sarah John Johnson, one of the members for the Longstanton Ward. Thank you. Councillor Graham Cohn. Good evening, I'm Councillor Graham Cohn, one of the members for Fenditton and Fulbourne Ward. Thank you, Graham. Councillor Claire Daunton. Um, yes, good evening. I'm um, one of the other members. Sorry, Councillor Claire Daunton. I'm one of the other members for the Fenditton and Fulbourne Ward. Thank you, Claire. Councillor Douglas De Lacey. I'm Douglas De Lacey. I'm one of the members for Girton Ward. Thank you, Douglas. Councillor Peter Fane. Good evening, Peter Fane, Shelford Ward. Uh, Councillor Jeff Harvey. Yes, uh, Councillor Jeff Harvey, member for Borsham Ward. Thank you, Jeff. Councillor Judith Ripith, who is also the vice chair. Good evening, I'm Councillor Judith Ripeth, one of the members for Milton and Waterbeach Ward. Councillor Richard Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. I'm Richard Williams. I'm the member for Whittlesford, Triplo, Heathfield and Newton. Thank you very much. 
Um, are there any members of the committee that I have missed? No, thank you very much indeed. Uh, agenda item one is apologies for absence. So can I ask Democratic Services if there have been any apologies for absence for this meeting, please? Thank you, Chair. We've had apologies from councillors Martin Khan, Joe Tales and Steve Hunt. Thank you very much indeed. Agenda item two is the declarations of interest. So do any committee members have any interest that they would like to declare in relation to any item on the agenda this evening, please? No, thank you very much indeed. Agenda item three is the minutes of the previous meeting. May I ask, are members happy to approve the minutes of the previous meeting, which was held on the 19th of January, or are there any matters of accuracy that members would like to raise? No, thank you Agreed. very much. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you very much. Uh, agenda item four is public questions, but I can confirm that we have received no public questions this evening. So we go straight on to agenda item five, which is the 3C ICT update. And I'd like to welcome Sagar Roy to the meeting and invite uh, Mr Roy to provide an update on ICT and answer any members' questions. Mr Roy, are you with us? I am. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Could I invite you to present your report, please? Sure. Uh, my name, for those who don't know me, I'm Sagar Roy. I'm the interim uh, head of uh, ICT and digital for the three councils um, as part of 3CICT. Um, and the report that um, I provided um, for the scrutiny committee was to cover uh, the data centre, um, the current um, a description of the current issues that we had basically during quarter three and also uh, an overview of the design and resilience that are currently built into it. Uh, I won't go through the whole report in detail. Um, I, I know that it's been um, uh, circulated previously, but just in summary, um, just breaking down the sections, um, the data centre provides services to uh, all three councils. Um, it so this was a project that started uh, shortly after uh, 2017 when 3CICT um, was formed. Uh, um, the first services went live um, in 2018 and the project closed in uh, quarter three, uh, 1920. Um, and the end of the project was to bring um, all the server rooms uh, across the three councils into two, lane two locations, one in Huntingdon uh, and one in Cambridge. Um, there's also um, a section, just the background of where South Cam's uh, started from uh, for that piece of work. Uh, and also there's reference to um, what's known as the Paul Tonkins report, which was a report commissioned by South Cam's um, uh, to review uh, IT services at the time. Uh, and that um, was supported by the EELGA uh, and they part funded that report as well. Uh, and um, uh, there's some, uh, Brief findings that I've mentioned in my report. Um, the current data centre, uh, as is, um, given an overview there, but in brief, uh, it runs um, in two halves. Uh, they run active active, so effectively uh, all live services across the three councils that we host uh, operate um, across those uh, sites uh, simultaneously. So it's not like one is down and ready to be um, activated when the other fails, they're both running live at the same time. Uh, now, uh, unfortunately, um, during quarter three, we did suffer a series of outages uh, and uh, in appendix one, I've included uh, a description and list of those outages that uh, were uh, affecting the uh, uh, ability to access services that are hosted within the data centre. Um, the main series of those outages um, uh, was caused by uh, a network card bug as a piece of hardware. Um, that there was a bug introduced as a result of uh, a software update that we applied uh, during quarter two uh, of that year. Uh, unfortunately, it took uh, a couple of incidents before we could actually narrow down exactly what the root cause was. Um, and we then took immediate action to replace uh, network cards. Uh, and we did that um, uh, over a, a period of four days out of hours. 
Uh, and since then, uh, since early November, we've had uh, no further interruptions as a result of that network card issue. And we've maintained the data center services from that point onwards. There is still other work going on and a result of uh, those outages, we did uh, bring in an external company um, to carry out a review of the data center. Uh, those findings are due to be with us in draft at the end of this month, and there'll be an exact report that'll be circulated um, uh, probably second week in March um, uh, where they will um, present their findings and make any other recommendations. Um, uh, we'll also add that um, at the end of January um, we did carry out a very significant uh, move and change to the data centre and part of the, uh, the reason for getting an external company in to help us review the data centre was to make sure that we could carry out that move safely uh, without interruption services, they provided advice uh, and that move was carried out successfully uh, uh, on 29th of January or that weekend. Uh, and we now have uh, the data centre that's half of its move from Cambridge uh, to its new location in Peterborough. Uh, and that's where we're operating from now. Um, so that's in summary uh, what I put in the report. Uh, and uh, like I said, the, um, the appendix one includes just a, a, a little bit more detail about the outages we suffered during quarter three. Thank you, Mr Roy. Um, I'm, I can see that there are a number of questions coming and I'd be grateful if you're of course. Able, able to stay long enough to uh, to answer them. Yeah, I'll be here. I'm here till uh, seven o'clock. Thank you. Councillor Rippert, who was first, please? Um, Councillor Dr De Lacey. Uh, thank you very much. Councillor De Lacey. Thank you very much indeed, Chairman, and thank you for Mr. Ro to Mr. Roy for your report. Um, I presume when the data centre was set up, there was a service level agreement. Um, can I ask what level of service you promised to provide at that point? And then I have a completely separate question, if that's right. Sure, no problem. I'll answer the first one. Um, so um, I've looked back through this and there was no definition uh, about uptime. However, there were some elements that were um, agreed um, and they were uh, and they included um, there was uh, a monthly downtime agreed as a window for maintenance so every month uh, four hours downtime uh, over a weekend um, each month which was allowed for server updates and patches to be applied uh, and uh, the only other um, element that was provided as part of the design was to maximize the existing tools and licensing uh, and technology to support availability. Now, I do know uh, that the South Cams had already invested quite heavily, actually, in uh, a particular server virtualization technology that we, we pretty much built the design of the data center around that licensing that was already provided. It kind of reused what was already invested. Thank you, so, Chairman. May I, may I come back on that, please? Please do. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and yet you had a significant failure, uh, which as you say, because you didn't have a service level agreement was not outside it. Um, you presumably had two identical pieces of kit to have the same problem uh, bringing both pieces of kit down. Is is that not effectively a single point of failure? Uh, what it was, it was um, so the, the bug that occurred was a cascading failure. So it affected both sides at the same time. So it wasn't a single point of failure. In fact, if you think about it, it was it was 12 plus network cars that all stopped at the same time, which effectively broke the interconnectivity between the two halves of the data centre. And then that's what stopped the uh, uh, the access to the data centre itself. And do you have different types of network card now to well, prevent this problem? The original, the original design actually uh, and the spec recommended a single uh, manufacturer across so you can keep the standardised kind of hardware. Uh, that was it was actually recommended by the provider of the hardware um, as well when we first put the data center in. Uh, what we did um, during this last uh, set of investigations, we actually um, went with uh, another recommended brand, but again, all the same, because the idea was to keep it all standardized so there's no, um, no chance of any conflicts or incompatibilities for different manufacturers. We sought external advice on that because we, we suggested, well, what if we do you know, half the data center in one manufacturer and half in another. 
uh, and that would what that would do actually actually complicate the uh, the process of uh, updates and patches and changes going forward, and that was felt uh, too risky. And uh, bear in mind we don't have a mirror environment to test everything. Thank you, Chairman. May I ask a different question, please? Yes, please. Thank you very much. Um, it's about the remote desktop service. Um, I realise that your report is only about the data centre, but would you care to comment on the problems that we've been having uh, with laptops and uh, officers and I believe some members unable to do their work because of these problems? Because of, is it access to the remote desktop service? Is that the... Well, this is the Lenovo desk, um, laptops. I don't know exactly where the problem is. Uh, You're not aware of this problem. Well, no, I'm aware there, there was a there's remote desktop access. That's that was a different service. There is a, an issue that we're dealing with at the moment, which is the Lenovo uh, desktops, not all of them, just a, 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 a particular build is suffering from startup issues as a result of um, a particular patch that uh, Microsoft Windows released uh, in uh, version, well, I'm going to version numbers. I can, I can quote version number, but I don't think it will mean very much to many people here. Um, but there is, a, there, there is, there's a problem that's affected, we think, um, uh, just under 12% of our laptops at the moment. Uh, there is a, a problem that we've got um, uh, that we're uh, looking at how we resolve it. It basically means when you reboot the machine, it doesn't always start up properly. Uh, and that we we have actually got it narrowed down to a particular update that was provided by Microsoft. We're not the only organisation to have suffered from it. There are others out there as well. Thank you. If if I may ask a subsidiary, uh, a supplementary is is part of the problem not that we are unable to prevent uh, Microsoft updating our machines. If if you could have sent a message out saying just don't update, that would have been a great problem. But I'm using one of the Lenovo's for this meeting. Uh, and it simply says I'm going to update and there's nothing I can do about it. Isn't that a weakness? Well, we, we can prevent some some updates from going out. We have the control. We have we have centralized tools that will let us manage the distribution of the software. So the software that did go out, um, it did go out. It was tested, um, uh, but it's only under certain conditions that it actually stops the um, uh, the laptop from booting properly. Um, so even with the testing that we carried out with the internal champions and the, the, the various service areas who help us out with that laptop testing when we do roll out these updates, um, it's just something that wasn't picked up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you. Um, Councillor Chung Johnson um, is next just, speaker. Just before I come to Sarah, can, Mr Roy, can I, can I just um, focus on the first point that you were talking about with Councillor De Lacey and relating to the network cards. Mm -hmm. You said the problem was as a result of an update. Was that a Microsoft update? Was no, it? that wasn't. No, that's that's um, so I probably should explain that. Sorry. Um, so the virtual server infrastructure, if you think of it as layers, you've got the hardware that the network sit, the network card sits at. Um, there's an there's another piece of software that sits across the data center which manages all the virtual infrastructures, uh, virtual servers. Um, it was it was a it was a bug within that software that caused the network cards basically to not operate. Thank you very much. Sarah, my apologies. Councillor Chung Johnson. That's fine, Grendel. Um, I have a few questions. Uh, one is actually a follow up to that network card, so since we're on that topic. Um, so you said that it wasn't, it doesn't classify technically as a single point of failure because you had 12 network cards, but actually it's a software bug that impacted all of those network cards. So I think the concern here is not whether or not we technically define it as a single point of failure, but that actually what it's showing is a lack of resilience in the system, that one software bug can take down effectively the entire system and mean that the council just can't do any work. So whether or not we define that technically as a single point of failure, it's still the impact is still the same because because of one bug, we lose all of our services. And that seems to me um, you know, a, a weakness that we obviously have. And are we confident that we don't have other weaknesses, other bugs, you know, at other points in the system that could also have a similarly um, large impact? OK, if I respond to that then. So we take all of the expected um, precautions uh, and measures when we do apply um, uh, patches, when we do choose um, 
uh, technology uh, and software to, to operate on. The, the software that we use is, is industry standard. Um, it's uh, it's probably one of the it's one of two of the um, the biggest virtual server um, uh, solutions used globally. Um, the the checks that we we ran prior to providing uh, sorry applying the updates, we went through all the recommended um, uh, checks. Uh, there's something called a hardware compatibility list that was checked. So our hard server hardware, our network cards, all appeared on that list as an OK we couldn't have predicted that that failure was going to happen and when it did when we had the vendor the software vendor come in and, and have a look um, they then have had to create a, a, a series of software updates themselves as a result of the the, the bug that we found okay um, and then as a follow-up on the service level agreement question from councillor lacy um, in that agreement are there any penalties for being have, have, having downtime for exceeding the amount that's specified in in the agreement. Is that penalties for three CICT to yeah, two South Cams? No, there's there's no uh, there's no penalties in that agreement at all. OK, so um, I'd just like to flag this then to Cabinet that I think that we need to review these service level agreements. It just seems to be a bit odd to me that we have a service provider that has no penalties um, for taking, you know, for having a service that's down uh, for such a long time. Um, can I also ask for the report itself that you are due to commission that's part of, um, you know, the future work, um, will you have some uh, lessons learned built into that? Um, and then also I note that you are looking at the, the cloud technology as being a solution. So will that also be um, reviewed to see whether or not that would have helped in this situation? OK, so that report that we're, we're going to get covers a, a number of areas. So one of those was the overall design. You know, does uh, does a design that's been implemented, um, uh, is it um, is it standard? Uh, has it been implemented the way it was intended? Um, it, is there, are there changes that we can make or should make? Um, and we we know that um, there, there are going to be some recommendations coming out of that because um, you know, because of the issues that we've had. But what we need to um, uh, kind of follow up on is, are those recommendations, are they suitable for our environment? Um, uh, the other area that they're going to be um, providing advice uh, and recommendations on is what the next steps are. Um, what do we need to do in the future in terms of our future strategy for uh, the, the on-premise uh, hosting uh, services that we provide. Uh, and then the last part is going to be uh, uh, basically a cloud readiness assessment. Are there uh, aspects uh, of the service that we provide that can be provided in another way in a host environment? Bearing in mind that all that, what that will do, that will transfer the risk. It won't remove the risk, it will just transfer it to an external service provider. Um, now, there are, uh, I know there was a question that came in um, uh, from I think from a pre-meet that you had that asked about um, why would uh, why did we not do that change as part of the move of the data center? Well, the scope of the move of the data center was just that it was taking the existing infrastructure from one location to another. Um, there wasn't um, enough uh, time or resource available um, to also build into that any move of services to a host environment. Bearing in mind that that move was paid for by county. It was a county site that we moved from um, and it's part of their agreement they provide that service to us. Um, so as part of the, uh, the report that we're going to be getting uh, from uh, our partner, we'll provide a, a recommended um, kind of next steps about how we consider moving more service to the, services to the cloud. That said, we have the opportunities already when applications and systems and services come up for replacement, come up for review, um, to move to hosted environments. And you know, bearing in mind that those decisions are made by service areas and jointly across the three councils, we've had opportunities to move some systems to hosted um, away from this premises. And, I mean, the latest one is the HR service system, which is going from on-premise to um, uh, cloud hosted. Um, uh, Tasco me 
um, and um, Yotta, you know, those two um, projects that are, that are in flight now, they elected to uh, choose um, uh, solutions that were hosted externally. Um, equally, there are ones that go the other way. There are decisions that are you know, projects that come in, set so housing system, for example, uh, that went live last year. Um, there was a cloud hosted option, but the service area picked the solution that was host on premise. Um, that in itself actually added to the on premise infrastructure. Um, it's going to be a long journey. I, I won't, I can't, you know, paint it any other way um, before we get to a point where uh, a lot of our services are hosted externally. Okay, understood. Chair, if I may, just one last question. Um, mm. I don't know if any of this, these these problems have been related, but we're having a lot of problems with the planning service. Um, parish councils are coming to us to say that they can't access documents, etc. Um, what is the cause of um, this system often being down? I think that is, I'll have to, if you, I need probably a bit more specific information okay. about which system, which service, but the, I, I'm, I think it's probably related to the uh, IDOCS application that uh, they're using because I think that's what shared planning is using. That yeah. is not designed. That's not designed to run remotely. Um, in fact, you, I mentioned earlier about which services that we um, moved to the cloud. That one, when shared planning went live, was actually a service that went from a hosted solution to an on-prem solution. It brought it back in-house. Um, uh, and that solution itself just isn't designed to be run remotely. Uh, uh, and we are throwing you know, resource, a computing resource to try and make that run run properly. Um, we're waiting for a roadmap from from the supplier themselves about how they can uh, update or provide that service differently. Okay, thank you. So, Chair, can I ask a, a specific question? Um, sorry, uh, Chair, we've got um, Councillor Bradman next on the committee members list, and Stephen Kelly has also yeah, asked to speak, so that might be relevant. I was just going to ask Stephen Kelly if he'd kindly come in because I think he probably wishes to comment on that uh, final point about IDOCS. Stephen, would you please? Thank you, Chair. Um, I mean, it was it was just really to add to to, to Sagar's point. Obviously, um, it's important to bear in mind that some of the outages that that we've experienced predated the server migration that has happened, and and you know both ourselves and 3C invested uh, in that server migration project to improve the resilience um, uh, but but over the autumn uh, and uh, the uh, in a sense the second part of 2020 there were a number of unscheduled outages associated with the kind of uh, age of the hardware that we were running the service on um, but Sagar is also right around um, finessing a, a service that's designed to be um, accessed uh, within a within a kind of fixed environment remotely uh, has also caused some problems but i think i think resilience has improved we still have some scheduled outages which are associated with upgrades that are part of the process and we are trying to communicate and accommodate those so we've got a little bit better organizing um alternative options but um uh, it is it is something that that Sega says we're aware of and we're, and we're trying to work with um, and if we are scheduling um, planned maintenance, do we, as a matter of course, notify the parishes that such work will be under undergoing, or do we put a note on the on the planning portal to indicate that it's not available we, at a specific time? We we have normally put advance notifications on the planning portal. Um, uh, a week or so ahead that indicates the system down uh, time and and for very large applications like Bourne Airfield and Water Beach and so on we've actually made arrangements to host the the documents elsewhere whilst the system has been down ahead of planning committees but um, we're always keen to understand whether the parish is accessing the portal in that way or whether they're just going direct to, to pages and so on so um, okay. we're always keen to improve. Thank you for that. Um, just before we invite the next councillor to speak, I'd like to bring in uh, the chief executive, if I may, uh, just for Liz to comment on the uh, issues around the uh, service agreement, because I'm, I'm not entirely convinced that um, in view of the structure that we have a formal agreement, do we, Liz? 
So we have a partnership agreement. Chair. Yes. I, I think it's worth reminding everyone that this isn't a contract. This is a shared service. Thank you. Uh, and so I suppose, you know, the implications of, uh, for example, a penalty on on downtime would be that we pay the penalty because we're, we're the ones who are in the service. So it's not as though we have a contractor external to us. Uh, the service is owned and run by uh, Hunt City and South Cams. So there is a partnership agreement that I think, if you remember, came to you probably around about last summer for scrutiny and then was signed off by Cabinet in September. Thank you very much. Right, so let's go back to the list of councillors and I will I will take the members of committee first and then come to uh, other councillors. Councillor Bradnam please. next. So, Councillor Anna Bradnam, please. Thank you, Chairman. I just wanted to ask, I wasn't here right at the very beginning, but I just wanted to ask whether the Chairman realises that his camera is off. That might be intentional. My camera is on. Oh, OK. I'm only seeing an icon of you. But OK, um, so my question um, relates to the Appendix A report and noting that, I mean, for example, on the Wednesday, the 10th of um, October, sorry, when, uh, sorry, the 7th of October 2020, in the description there, we've got the description of the downtime and of course, it started at six o'clock in the evening on the 7th of October and was finally resolved um, at just after midday on the 8th of October, which overlapped outside normal working hours and working hours. Um, and it was elapsed, it was 18 and a half hours interruption, but only four and a half hours described as normal working hours. But I just wanted to clarify what are our under, what is our understanding about the fact that now, of course, many staff and indeed members are working from home and outside those normal hours. So it presents a greater disruption to staff working from home maybe later on in the evening than they would do normally um, and and indeed members. I just wondered um, Mr Roy whether you could whether whether what's your understanding of our um, you know targets around that. Okay um, so yeah we, we understand that obviously uh, because of the changing working practices now that people are working different hours now and we do our best to accommodate and support that. Um, we provide the service that we can with the resourcing, the staff and the budgets that we've got available. Um, if we wanted to scale that up, then it's going to cost and we'll have to put bids in um, in the next kind of financial round come September for that. Um, we are taking guidance and um, a steer from um, intelligent clients and the, the service areas around what kind of service they want. We do our best to accommodate that. Um, even, you know, I, I mentioned it in the uh, in the report that when we do those, um, uh, when we carry out those maintenance windows, we are doing those outside normal hours. We're doing them at 10 in the evening, yeah. 12 midnight, so that we can try and avoid those busier times. Um, if this happens, if this has to continue that way, then yeah, we need to look at a different operating model uh, for IT services. I just, I just, it was, I recognised that and I just wondered really um, how sustainable the system is given that now we're working increasingly from home. Do you see what I mean? It's not that I'm criticising, yeah. I'm just saying given that we're now working more from home, is the model that we have going um, sufficiently resilient for that? And, and it sounds like Perhaps we just have, you know, at the moment we're having to say, well, if it's and I can see that they've often been resolved at eight o'clock in the evening. So obviously your staff have been working late to try and sort things out. Um, and indeed, when you've got planned maintenance, you obviously are doing that deliberately outside working hours. But I just wondered whether you felt that was a sufficiently resilient um, backup system for us, as it were. I think what I'll say is that we, we have to continually just review what kind of service is required. Because if you'd asked me last February, can you cope, can you cope with this for three months, six months? I would have said, yeah, we can probably do that. You know, six months on, there was no change in sight, but who, you know, you couldn't predict how yeah. much uh, change there would be in the way in which working practices um, uh, are being run. You know, how this changes 
service areas, uh, even from their own business process point of view. Um, this does need a, 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 a wider review. In fact, yeah. we've, we've already recommended from a business continuity point of view, never mind the operating hours. This has to change the way in which people want to plan their uh, kind of um, work. Um, before COVID-19 hit, your resilience plans would have involved you sending staff home to work. It's the other way around, it's flipped around the other way around, but our service provision model doesn't necessarily account for that. And that's not something you can change in six months or even 12 months. That's mm -hmm. gonna need a bigger piece of work. But you're right, I mean, if this is the way in which we, we think we're gonna operate um, going forward, then yes, of course, we need to consult with the service areas, consult with the councils. How do you want to operate? And here's what we can provide with the resources we've got available. Um, if you want a different kind of service, then this is what it's going to cost you. So I, I just I just wanted to check whether there's a review in 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 the in the work program, as it were. So as part of that, the, the, one of the reviews that is already, I mean, this is less for ICT, it's more for the service areas across all three councils, is look at your business continuity process. Right now, if anything goes wrong, the chances are you have to come back into the office as opposed to head out elsewhere to other sites. Um, how does that change the way in which you you know, everything from communicating to your staff with what equipment is available. Mm. Okay, Thanks. thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. Chair, Councillor Harvey. Councillor Jeff Harvey, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, uh, I just want to understand a bit better um, what the thinking is um, behind having the centre split onto two sites. I wondered, is, is that because it just happens to be uh, kind of space um, on those sites to accommodate the total of the equipment or is there a strategic reason in terms of you know there's redundancy on two different sites so if, if a sort of bomb drops on one it, it can't destroy the other because I suppose um, you could argue that you could have redundancy on a single site for example you could maybe have two separate rooms two separate air conditioners um, different power supplies that kind of thing um, which might lead to a lower cost solution I suppose um, just I think the rest of the committee were quite intrigued to know why we've ended up with one and half of the uh, servers in Peterborough, which isn't kind of one of the three uh, partners in, in 3C. Um, and I suppose that leads on to what would the liability be if um, the uh, server room hosted in Peterborough, if the air conditioner were to fail there, whose responsibility would that be? Is that something to do with Peterborough uh, City Council? Um, and also um, just uh, representing the Climate Environment Committee, the, the way in which the um, service have been kind of wandering around um, the county um, creates a bit of an issue for us in terms of our scope one emissions, because I think um, the data centre does consume quite a lot of power um, and there might be ways of, uh, for example, um, sleeving power, for example, from one of uh, the county's um, green energy um, generators uh, if we had confidence that it was going to stay in one place for a particular length of time. Also, um, sorry there's so many uh, questions here, but um, is there any option to um, profile the power usage through the 24 hour cycle and and somehow, um, you know, close down some virtual servers uh, at night in order to save power? Um, that's an optional question, I think. Thank you. OK, so uh, first question, um, so I can get these in order, is around the decision around um, the split. So um, that was um, as part of the strategy. It was uh, they needed to be geographically diverse. We wanted to make sure that uh, an issue in one location wasn't going to be affecting another. Um, the original design uh, obviously had Shy Hall and Pathfinder House. Shy Hall, um, uh, has been um, sold off, I understand, uh, County of um, uh, uh, handing it over to developers later this year. Um, we buy a service from them uh, and we need to um, make sure that we maintain their services. Uh, their recommendation was to um, provide that service from their shared location in Peterborough. Uh, that was run past uh, or, or agreed and approved by the shared services board um, uh, as, a, as, a, as a piece of work um, and that's why Peterborough still remains as part of that strategic agreement. Uh, now with regards to 
um, the power usage. Um, we already use um, the automation tools built in within the virtual server environment to use that um, uh, hardware efficiently. Um, it, it moves servers around um, so they're on the most efficient kit. Uh, there are no spinning disks, they're all SSDs. Um, the, um, the efficiency of those um, servers and the equipment, they're as good as they can possibly be um, without um, over provisioning, perhaps, you know, cutting back on hardware and then risking performance. I think we've got the right balance there. Uh, in regards to moving the, the kit to uh, another location that can make use of um, power provided by um, existing green initiatives, um, we'll have to consider that uh, our strategic um, uh, plans are that they that, they, that half the server uh, environment remains in Peterborough. Uh, that will be up for review probably in three years' time. Thank you very much. Did that answer all your questions, Councillor? I, I think it, I got them all. Yes, it did. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, okay. Chair. Councillor Rippeth, I think it's you next. Just a quick question. Um, so how confident are you that the chances of these outages happening again are much reduced? OK, so we we know that the um, uh, the work we did to replace network cards uh, last uh, October, November has reduced the chances of that happening. We've, we've seen that the fact that we're now where are we February 25th, so that must be. 18 weeks of uninterrupted um, running from the network card bug point of view. Um, we're confident that we've got that resolved. Uh, that said, you know, there's always improvements that we can make and we will make as a result of recommendations that come through report uh, that we will see very soon. Um, uh, at some point, um, we can we can tune this within an inch of its life uh, and then you're only going to get more resilience by throwing more money at it. Um, in, you know, if we think that's worthwhile, then we'll come back to the councils uh, and ask for additional funding um, and guidance on how much more they want from the service. OK, thank you. Interesting. Um, OK, Jeff Membry would like to speak. Yeah, the Head of Transformation. Jeff, would you like to come in? Uh, thank you very much, Chair. This was just uh, to Councillor Bradnam's point about new working arrangements, just to make the uh, the committee aware that officers are undertaking a moving forward project, which is looking at what impact um, COVID and the new ways of working that have come out of that is going to have going forward. And we expect that what will come out of that is a better understanding of what we need from the IT service going forward and can inform those discussions. I just thought you needed to be aware. That's very helpful. Thank you very much indeed. I see that Councillor De Lacey would like to come back and then I'll come to Councillor Milnes. Councillor De Lacey. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I've just had a news flash from the university saying that Queen's University Belfast is being attacked by a ransomware attack on the Active Directory servers. Uh, I'd just like reassurance that uh, we are safe from that kind of attack, please. Our Active Directory servers are well up to date, are they? Yeah, so I, I, I can't comment on exactly what um, that university is, is being attacked from, or it, but uh, what I can say is that um, obviously um, I, I know Councillor Lacey, you've, you've got you've you've got a background in IT, so you understand how important Active Directory is in terms of infrastructure. Um, uh, yes, Active Directory, well, I can give you assurance on it. Active Directory, because it's a critical part of what we do and how we operate things, it, it, it controls access, it controls accounts. Um, it's a key part of our infrastructure um, that we protect as, as well as we can. Um, we we do re annual pen, in fact, we do pen tests three times a year um, and anything that comes out of that, um, uh, we, we take seriously in terms of, especially if it highlights any uh, vulnerabilities with AD. Um, uh, all the usual things you'd expect around replication and backups, offline backups uh, are steps that we take. Thank you. You might like to look within the next four months at this particular attack. Yeah, uh, I mean, what, we're covered. yeah, what we'll say, in okay. fact, um, and, and this kind of, uh, and this is probably more um, kind of relevant to this, this audience. 
Um, the red car in Cleveland, uh, the attack they suffered last February. Um, I was part of a debrief uh, and there were lots of lessons learned from, from that. More to do with the response as opposed to um, what they actually suffered from. But one of the recommendations that, uh, or one of the things that came out of that was protect AD at all costs was basically their one message because it adds weeks, if not months to recovery time. Uh, and we take that seriously. Good, good. thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. You're, you're very welcome, Councillor De Lacey. I was getting a little bit worried with you talking about attacks and Councillor Harvey before you talking about bombs going off. I wondered what had happened at, at since 20 past five. Um, I see the leader would like to speak. So, leader, would you like to come in, please? Bridget, are you with us? Can... Uh, right, yes, I'm there. Sorry, it's very sensitive. Actually, it, well, it's just really fortuitous um, what Councillor De Lacey has just said, because I, I sit on the Safer and Stronger Communities Board at the Local Government Association, and we had a briefing today from an expert uh, on their cyber security program. And um, they, they are conducting a piece of work called closing the loophole. Now the loophole, very interestingly, is that it is illegal for government departments to pay ransoms, but it's not, not currently illegal for local authorities to pay ransoms. So in the case that um, has just been referenced, a ransom was paid and a ransom of about a, around a million pounds was paid wow. by the local authority. I gather that actually it was the Treasury that paid it um, in that circumstance, because the cost of sorting this out is estimated, like we were told today, at between 10 and 15 million pounds. Now, you know, the, the, there's many doubt, and what they were saying is that when you look at the incidents of these major cyber attacks, which are ba mainly based on phishing, um, every time someone pays a ransom, the incidences go up. So what we, what my board has just promoted today is putting a private members bill or something to government to close this loophole so that if it's known that local authorities are legally not allowed to pay ransom, it will reduce the likelihood of an attack. But as soon as a local authority has paid a ransom, there will be an exponential increase in attacks on local authorities because we are seen as fair game. Now, I did ask the question about, um, you know, if you pay up the money, will you actually get all your data back? To which the answer was, well, you might, but of course they could have copied it all in the meantime. And then, of course, we also have the, have the added risk of prosecution from the ICO, which could add many more million pounds. So the question that I am going to take back to um, the senior leadership team is about, um, is this on our risk register? Is it, is it highlighted as red? Because I gather there are, uh, well, councils apparently are getting dozens, if not hundreds of attacks a day. I'd be quite interested to know how many we are getting a day. So is it on a re re risk register? Um, are we insured against it? Um, how would audit deal with it if something happened? So, I th so I, that's quite. I'm really pleased that that uh, point was raised. So I've been able to bring this to attention. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I see that Councillor Anna Brad would like a very brief follow-up question. So, Councillor Bradnam, a very brief question, if you would please. Was Councillor Toomey Hawkins first? No, I'm going to. Uh, Councillor okay. Toomey Hawkins is not on this committee, oh, so I'm taking committee you. members first. OK, it is a very brief one, and that is, where is it in Peterborough? Is it at Peterborough City Council or is it somewhere else in Peterborough? It's at San Martin House, so it's part of their um, new new facility. Thank you. Um, and so if, I, if I may, uh, I just want to just comment on um, uh, the, in, I think there was a comment made about insurance. Um, so uh, we were approached, ICT were approached uh, um, to feed into an, a, uh, a consortium of councils who are looking at cyber insurance policy uh, and one of the questions that we've raised in there is that does uh, we've got to make sure that whatever policy that we might buy into doesn't penalize us for not wanting to pay a ransom i think that, and that that plays to the point that was just raised by raised by um, um councillor smith 
uh, around we shouldn't be paying ransoms. Um, yeah. There are some insurance policies that will obviously they want a quick and easy way out um, uh, and that might mean them recommending paying a, a ransom out, which is obviously ethically uh, uh, probably not ideal. If the law is changed, it's not something we'll have to worry about. Yeah. And Chairman, while, while I'm thinking about it, where is the other one? If one is at Peterborough, where's the other one? It's in Huntingdon at Pathfinder House. OK, thank you. Right, thanks. I, I'm going to come now to uh, other lead members and I'm going to come first to Councillor Brian Mills. Bye. Thank you, Chair. Um, since my time with you uh, on the scrutiny committee, I've recently been asked by the cabinet to take uh, responsibility for our ICT affairs. So I come to you this evening um, with some significant interest in uh, Sagar's report to you. Um, and also, you remember I was part of the working party on scrutiny uh, with I ICT. I remember it extremely well. And it's sad to say that I'm not convinced that we've made huge amounts of progress since there in some some uh, accounts. I think the um, the lack of a service level agreement um, uh, for me is a, re a residual matter that we ought to uh, be addressing here. Uh, there, there ought to be some expectation uh, of the, for example, the maximum accept acceptable downtime. Um, uh, Sagar has referred to some of that in terms of the uh, uh, the, the joint agreement that was um, the creation of the shared service. Um, so as part as part of your new responsibilities, Councillor Mills, are you going to um, ensure that a service level agreement and maximum downtime levels are set and established? Or is that something that you would like to see as a recommendation from this committee? Um, I already share many of the committee's reservations about the level of service that we've had from our ICT over the years. Um, in the three years since I've been here, we've had uh, continuing um, outages that have really been, uh, I think, unacceptable. Um, despite, you know, huge efforts on the part of the ICT staff who have valiantly, uh, you know, tried to um, make uh, good um, some of the failures. Um, you know, the historical uh, investment in ICT, particularly in South Cairns, was uh, very low. Uh, it was a rickety old system when um, uh, we got into the administration three years ago, and it's improved significantly since then. The, uh, the ability for us to uh, support remote working uh, since the COVID crisis has you know, demonstrated that we were in a far better place uh, uh, than we when we first started. So it's not to say that there has not been significant progress in this regard, but there are still uh, remaining issues. And there are particular issues around um, the structure of the management of the contract or the, the agreement. Uh, that was something that uh, we talked about at length. We asked for, for example, a, a document repository, you'll remember. That uh, doc shared uh, document repository uh, still is not available. Um, so there are issues like this that I want to uh, um, see addressed. When I'm, when, um, I, want, I want to interject when um, the issue of the planning system and DIDOCS uh, was raised, because this is a big part of our uh, responsibility and public facing role. Mm -hmm. To say that uh, we have a system that it is not designed for remote access seems quite phenomenal to me. The applicants, everybody involved, in, are wanting to access this system remotely. It's not an inter some internal system and it continues to uh, be unavailable too frequently for comfort. Um, so that's another issue that I would certainly want to take take up um, as part of the, the service. But then there were other, other things. If you remember um, Sagar, there was a, um, a, an issue, if you remember when the certificates expired unexpectedly. 
and we had a situation where the report said the reason we uh, there was further delay was that we didn't have a credit card on which to pay for the upgrade to the certificates which would suggest that we didn't have some credit with a supplier that could provide this uh, for me that's quite quite astonishing um so if, if there are still issues of that nature floating around and that wasn't too long ago i mean was that nine months ago perhaps uh Sega, i can't that remember that was uh august 12th councillor mills I, by the sound of it i think there are a number of issues here that probably need to be handled outside this meeting um i think we will will make a recommendation that a service level agreement maximum downtime uh, ought to be put in place but by the sound of it there are other matters which um, need to be addressed and I don't think we can deal with them here tonight but I'd like to invite um, Sagar to come back perhaps in a quarter's time and let us discuss this again in the light of uh, your new appointment and um, activity in this area which I hope will lead to addressing some of the issues which you've just alluded to. So I'm, I'm having a sequence of meetings with both Jeff Memory, Memory um, and uh, Anne Ainsworth uh, to establish uh, our position in terms of, you know, one of the three partners of, of the shared service. Um, it, it's clear that uh, there are other changes uh, occurring. So with the chief executive of the city uh, and so on, where I think the, there may be a shift in uh, or a potential for shifting um, reaction from another one of the parties um, so that we can continue to improve yeah. uh, what, what we've got. And I mean, that's the, the fundamental uh, issue here, you know, not, not to worry too much about historically what's gone on and just to make sure that yeah, we too. continue to support 3CICT in uh, providing a much more robust and um, you know, invisible service, uh, if, if, if you like, um, you know, it, it ought not to uh, be impinging on a day to day activity. And, and she failed to mention when she was just talking, but the, uh, the leader was not very happy to effectively have lost her secretary this uh, uh, this past week or so uh, because of this issue <laughs> with the laptops. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm sure you We'll have our full support and we wish you well in your new role. Thank you. Uh, uh, Chair, there's um, Councillor Hawkins left if you want to take that. Yes, I'd like to. Councillor Jimmy Hawkins, please. Uh, good evening and thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for allowing me to uh, to come in. I will try and be brief, but um, I just wanted to express uh, my concern that um, the outages that have been occurring have been affecting planning quite severely. Um, and we are a public facing service, as you know. Um, I know you said that, uh, Mr. Roy, that 12% of the machines that uh, the that were supplied were not rebooting. But it seems to me as if a large proportion of that is with our planning officers. I mean, there are two of them today who couldn't communicate because they didn't have, um, you know, their laptops were not working. Um, so I guess my question is how much longer uh, do they have to wait to get their service back? And I also note that the outage that occurred just after the new year is not on your list here. Um, on the Monday, the 4th of January, uh, the public access on um, IDOCS had fallen over. Um, we raised this issue, but it was not resolved until after midday on the Tuesday, by which time I'd had a lot of complaints. So why do you not have out of hours cover? And I really would uh, urge you to please resolve whatever it is that's occurring that's making the validation team unable to meet uh, the targets that we've set for them because the rest of the service, especially the delivery, is dependent on them. Thank you. OK, um, the, the report, the report um, was with only with only including uh, the data center outages. So uh, uh, the, the outages you talk about for the uh, shared service um, or the planning portal, sorry, 
um, I have to look into that separately. Um, that wasn't included um, deliberately on on that report. That was only to cover the uh, the data center outages. Um, with regards to the laptops in the um, uh, planning team, um, I was, I'll check with um, Jeff. We, we work with Jeff closely on a daily basis on prioritising which laptops get reviewed and rebuilt. Um, uh, I can only um, ask that if you give me um, till tomorrow and I'll find out where they are in that in that list. Um, I'm not aware of anything that's uh, outstanding, um, particularly uh, over a long time, um, but I'll, I'll double check. Mr Roy, um, we talk about 12% of our laptops. How many is that in a finite number? Um, we've had 175 that we fixed out of a fleet of 1440. Wow, so it's quite a lot. 12% probably therefore represents something like 160, 170 devices. So it is a lot. Um, you've fixed 175. How many do you think you've got to go? Well, uh, we monitor on a daily basis. Today we only had um, four come in, whereas last week we were seeing, um, I think the peak we saw 20 came in in a day. So it's, it's come right down. Um, uh, in terms of volume of uh, devices. We're not seeing that many come in anymore. Do we have any spare ones that we can give to people? Who... They, they've, they've already been issued. The spares that we had have already gone out. Well, I think I've probably come to the end and we, I don't see any more speakers. So, um... yeah, Final speakers. <laughs> sorry? Yeah, sorry, I'm just confirming that speakers are finished. So... I'm just going to re revert back to the recommendations that we have, um, which is to, I think, to to take note of this report. Um, but I would also like to add a recommendation from this committee um, that a service level agreement specifying the maximum downtime uh, should be drawn up and uh, resubmitted and remain in place um, going forward. Is it the view of the committee? Would, would you generally wish to see that that would happen? Agreed. Yes, agreed. OK, so we'll agreed. We'll leave that with the officers to take away. I'm sure um, that the remaining question that Dr Hawkins has asked, Mr Roy, would you like to uh, make sure that democratic services get a copy of that and that can be included with the minutes? And uh, you've heard the recommendation which will be coming forward. Uh, but could I thank you very much for uh, coming along this evening and explaining the uh, present situation to us. I'm sure we'll see you again soon. Sure, thank you. Thank you, councillors. <coughs> so uh, let us move on to agenda item six, which is the housing repair contract process. And could I invite the lead cabinet member for housing, Councillor Hazel Smith, if she would like to present her report, please. Hazel. Over Thank you, you, Chairman. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? <clears throat> right, good. Um, I'll, I'll just say some words about this um, bit of history and then I'll hand over to Peter Campbell in case I've missed anything. Um, the um, responsiveness of the housing repairs arrangements actually matters very significantly to our tenants and the satisfaction with the whole housing service is coloured by this relationship. Um, it's, it's also a very big contract, many millions of pounds a year. So this is why we need to take great care in choosing the right contractor or indeed in-house service and specifying in the contract all the service standards that are important to us. Uh, we engaged ARC Consultancy, who are national experts, to help us with this tendering process. The report before you is the second stage of this work and follows an initial scoping report. The conclusion of this report is that we should continue to use a specialist contractor to handle our housing repairs and maintenance and the writing of the tender specification will be the final part of this work. Peter Campbell has warned me that the tender document itself will be hundreds of pages long so that at that stage when we consult again we will not want minuscule changes to be proposed so now is a good time to seek some input from the scrutiny committee. Um, the previous contract ran from 2012. There was a light touch review um, in 2017 and then it was reviewed, it was um, 
renewed for another five years. Um, that review introduced the concept of price per property, but it did not look at the performance on dealing with voids. Um, it does have social value requirements in it. Mears took on two apprentice apprentices throughout and paid for another officer to help tenants who were falling into arrears with budgeting and benefits advice. And that was really helpful to us. They've also given us help behind the, uh, behind the scenes in helping kind, like uh, decorating communal rooms for us. The void work is done while the property is empty after a tenant leaves, and these are often major refurbishments. Often as tenants get older, they resist the offer of a new kitchen or bathroom because they don't want to cope with the upheaval. And we tend to accept that maybe more than other housing providers do. We do not have well, we do have a lot of older tenants in our housing and not just in sheltered housing, but also in general needs. The result is a larger amount of work needed when they do leave. Um, you'll notice that in the very useful benchmarking work towards the end of this report, um, many of our statistics are way outside the averages that they quote. And I think this is explained by what I've just said about our tenant profile to a large degree. Um, the overall cost of the service seems to be lower than their benchmark. If you look on page 67, um, that if you multiply up their benchmark with our number of houses, it's 11.6 million. So we have been getting value for money, I believe. Our housing is recognised to be of a good standard and well maintained, but our current contract with Mears has been criticised as not up to modern specification and the new contract should have more relevant key performance indicators and levers we can pull when the performance drops. Of course, all the statistics have gone wild over the last year. Um, for long periods, including the current lockdown, only emergency re repairs have been done, for example, to keep tenants safe. Uh, but for benchmarking, we're mostly looking at previous years. I'm hoping that those of you have been called on by tenants over housing maintenance problems. And of course, as local members, we're only called in when things go badly wrong. So we do need to be aware of that. We're not seeing the average um, that, that you will think about what we can add to the tender to improve this relationship with the contractor going forwards, because I think members input will be very useful. Um, and I look forward to your comments on the report. Well done. Thank you very much. Peter, was there anything that you wish to add? Yeah, I'll just fill in some of that, uh, if you ever may. Uh, I mean, Hazel's quite right. For tenants, a major influence on their satisfaction with the, the landlord is an experience of, of the repair service. If we were tenants, we'd all want, we'd all want a, a, a good uh, repair service. Uh, and a, a well-run repair service has obvious benefits for the council and for our tenants. And conversely, a poor service will cause it, causes um, uh, unneeded um, uh, uh, upset and tension. And at the end of the day, we'll fill all our inboxes with, with, with complaints. It's really important that, that we get this right. The repairs contract that we've got is actually made up of two parts, both with MIAs. The main contract uh, was due to uh, expire in March next year. Um, and that's the that has previously been extended and we've got a separate heating contract which was due to um, end uh, in June this year uh, but that is able to be extended with the agreement uh, of uh, the procurement team we're proposing uh, well we have agreed with mayors to extend both contracts slightly or one slightly to June uh, June of next year uh, and in doing so we'll um, put um, uh, enough Mass within the uh, uh, within the tender to make it uh, attractive for for some main providers uh, and the soft marketing by the consultants uh, as uh, as as confirmed um, that um, the report is hands up. It's fairly critical uh, about the uh, about our current arrange, uh, current arrangements. It's an old fashioned contract. It's a contract which is described as being comfortable from, from both sides. We don't really uh, issue challenges to, to, to the contractor. Uh, and because of that and because of comfort, it's unlikely to, to deliver the standard of service that, that, we, that we require. And remembering that tenants' expectations of services increases over, 
uh, all the time. Some performance is poor and some appears poor, um, but some of that is out of choice, such as you know, our um, void um, costs are higher than, than, than many others, but partly of that is generated by the fact that we have a much slower turnaround. So our tenants stay in properties for, for much longer than, uh, than they do elsewhere. And we choose to let properties in good condition in the hope that they will be valued by the tenants moving in. Other landlords make other choice and let, and let properties quickly uh, and, and, take, uh, and do work uh, post-tenancy. We have a clear lack of service standards and performance data and, and we need, to, we need to, uh, to improve. The report looks at a range of options for providing the future service, but boils it down to two. Either retender the service or to, to provide the service uh, in-house. And the recommendation from that is to, to retend the service out to a specialist advisor. The reasons for that is that an in-house service would be high risk. We're a relatively small player uh, in the field and we, we may struggle to retain uh, specialist staff, whereas a larger contract can draw people off other contracts or from other areas, areas of the country. In-house will be higher cost, albeit marginally. We don't currently have the skills in-house to, to manage uh, a contract. We'd have to bring people in and we'd have to bring people in before the contract. But the main reason is that we've, as I said, we've not particularly handled the current contract well. It's hard to see that we'll be expected to not only handle the contract, but handle our, handle our own teams for, for, from, a, from a standing start and provide the sort, um, the, um, uh, the sort of service that our, our tenants deserve. And uh, as Hazel said, you know, we, um, what we want to do is to make the service better in the future. We've also, we've already started um, uh, discussions with, with, with members through informal cabinet, et cetera. And there's some really excellent ideas that, that have come out of that process. With um, this uh, increase in the social value, apprentices and training, which, which Hazel's mentioned, but also important things that where a good relationship with the contract can, can lead to a better overall service. So, for example, we'd expect a, a contractor's operative in a house. If he saw signs which may suggest safeguarding concerns or domestic abuse concerns, we won't be able to capture that information uh, and feedback um, that um, back. Um, and we would expect um, any contractor to make a You're frozen, Peter. Peter that was very telling, wasn't Well, it's our fault we're talking about IT problems. It's a tempting fate. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and we would expect a contractor to make um, contribution towards um, many of the other priorities of the council um, you know, about treating people well uh, and, and the, uh, the, the you're frozen again, I'm afraid. Um, would it, Chairman, it would be a good idea if to have to turn your video off? Much as we like to see you. Can, Can you hear me now? Yes. No, you've gone again, I'm afraid. Right, what, what I'll do, Chair, I, I, will, I will leave the meeting and rejoin. OK. Um, I think we'll just have to... We could hear you just then. <laughs> yes. We'll just have to yeah, hold on. Yeah. We'll just have to hold on for a, a moment or two while Peter goes out and then comes back in again. Uh, Liam, as soon as um, you see Peter in the waiting room, would you let him straight in, please? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Thank yeah. you. Sorry about this, everyone. I've got a spare laptop here. You can have a council laptop here that I never use. You're welcome to. 
I hope I'm back with you now. It does sound that way. Let's hope it stays like that. Carry on. I've, I've got the end of my presentation, so if there's any questions. Yes, oh, there, there, there are certainly Cathcart. questions. Sorry, right. Councillor Nigel Cathcart first. Councillor Nigel Cathcart, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Kibben. Yes, um, you know, I think it's a good report, and I think that Peter Campbell gave yeah, a very thoughtful uh, review and analysis and um, teased out the, uh, the salient issues. Um, speaking personally, I, I wouldn't... Um, I, 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 I recognise the arguments against um, uh, uh, retaining in-house, but my feeling is to keep it on the table, if possible, at least to some extent. Um, it gives sort of a greater flexibility. Uh, we can provide training and apprenticeships where necessary. Uh, there's a closer contact with the uh, with the operatives, and it wasn't many years ago that we did actually have our own direct labour organisation, and I think it actually worked quite well. So one can make out a case for actually uh, retaining a, uh, an, an in-house service. Um, uh, and as I say, I wouldn't like to feel it just disappeared altogether. Just my feeling is to keep it on the table and look at the, uh, uh, you know, to, the, to, to, to look at, at if we make it work. The other thing is looking at the figures, it looks as if actually the, the setup costs would be higher. That is true. I think they're about 850,000. But the actual yearly costs, uh, looking at page 30, 30, 30, 38 is about 7.8 million compared with about 8 million for the um, option one, the outsource, outsource, outsourced service. Um, so it looked to me, and I may be wrong here, but it looked to me as if the annual operating costs are a bit lower than the outsource costs uh, and I agree that the actual setup costs will be higher but that, that's a one-off and there's a difference as far as I see about 550,000 uh, uh, excess uh, setup costs for the in-house service but that is over the life of the contract so if you spread that over the life of the contract there might not be a great deal in it um, uh, so I think it's something that sort of, you know, can still be considered uh, at this stage. And the other issue, the other, the other point I like to make, and uh, building on what Peter Campbell said, is that the um, uh, this uh, the, the, one of the reasons why sometimes the, the service runs into difficulty in the district is the fact that it is uh, it, it's not unique, but it's it's a much more difficult service to provide in the sense because it's scattered throughout over a hundred villages. Um, and the variety of stock is probably greater uh, than many parts of the country, from pre-war stock to modern uh, modern estates. They're often quite small, so they're difficult to provide that service. Um, uh, and also, of course, like many other authorities, many of the stocks have, stock has been sold. So you've got a, a mixture of uh, stocks, of houses which have been bought, uh, and those which are still retained by the councils. All that adds to the difficulty in cost of maintaining the service. And I agree that. Uh, Beers has done a fairly good job because I personally I don't seem to get many com uh, uh, complaints. So there are one or two, but these complaints generally because of the difficult nature of the house. Um, so that's as, and the other point I really like to make is the if you like the council's green agenda. Uh, but this could be an opportunity. This to some extent and maybe another argument for uh, still considering the in-house option. Um, but we have recently uh, approved a very sort of fairly radical and imaginative and long-term policy on climate change uh, and this is an opportunity to incorporate that philosophy within the uh, within the contract so um, I mean there are a whole range of things that can be done I agree with response uh, uh, response repairs when you just sort of repair an emergency issue like a tap or a missing slate that is, is different but the bulk of this work, as far as I can establish, is maintenance, planned maintenance. And there is a considerable scope for introducing uh, sustainable and uh, uh, and uh, other uh, measures into that contract. Now, the time to do it probably is now. Um, we might not be able to do it in every case, I totally agree. But at least we can sort of say to ourselves, 
this is the ideal we would like to achieve. Is it feasible and possible? Will it cost too much? Um, and can it be done? If we leave it too late in the day when the contract is signed, uh, then it'll probably be too late because me as well, or whoever is appointed will quite rightly say, well, you know, we, we, we've signed the contract. There are no elements in there which we can actually um, adjust very easily to accommodate your desires. So, you know, a number of points there, but overall, yes, I think that, uh, you know, the contract needs improvement, um, but I'd just like to see, as I say, uh, the, the climate change issue addressed at an early stage as possible, and also um, uh, the, you know, the uh, in-house option uh, still considered, if possible, to, as an option. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Smith, would you like to comment on that? Um, yes, um, and in terms of uh, the green agenda, um, we, that that comes down to the asset management strategy, which which Peter's been working on, and which will um, it it will inform what we are asking them to do. But it it would be the same whether they were our our operatives or the um, contractors' operatives. Um, mm. What we would be asking them to do. So we can we can certainly do that anyway. Um, and we, um, I spoke to the um, the manager of Mears. Um, they have a, a new guy who came in towards the end of last year about um, electric vehicles, and and Mears do have um, a program nationwide um, to bring in electric vehicles. So so he's going to go and look at that. I think the problem might be in this area that they will struggle to find places to charge them so we need to provide the charging points and then and then you know as as they ramp up they um any contractor can be asked to bring in more and more electric vehicles um which which, which is good um uh, i think i think it's probably easier for them to do it rather than us to manage a small fleet um you know as we as, as we've seen in at the depot you know these things turn over over quite a long period of time Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Not, Councillor Cathcart's other point was the option of the in-house service. Where, 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 where do you stand on that? Um, well, I think the, the um, I, I've certainly seen over the years, I've seen both because I was on the DLO board when we had our in-house service and I was very sceptical about us going out to Mears. Um, but um, having seen the problems we get sometimes getting um, the right trained people to do particular jobs in this area. I know that um, you know a nationwide company has been able to bring down operatives from the north yeah. um, for the week so that they've been able to um, to keep the numbers here up um, and that's that's certainly an advantage. Um, it, there's, there's a bit more resilience there having a bigger company behind it and as Peter said actually we are quite a small player in this field although we've got 5,000 houses that is not you know it's not even a medium-sized housing association um, so um, I, I think probably um, this is the right decision that um, that we should go with uh, with a nationwide contractor. Thank you. The next speaker is Councillor Graham Cohn, I think. Uh, Councillor Ripith, am I right? Yes, sorry, Councillor Cohn. Thanks, Chairman. Um, I just wanted to um, firstly say I think the report's a very good one and it highlights the different options, it, you know, and it puts it very clearly. Um, I want to talk a little bit about communication. So it's mentioned a lot in, in the report um, uh, on page 29. Um, there's an example of where you know communication has been lacking in paragraph two there and then on page 37 where we're looking at addressing it and I really just wanted firstly to ask how does that communication model how, how is that going to evolve and how is that going to look obviously communication isn't just about um, uh, uh, tenants feeding back uh, uh, sort of service delivery or how well their repairs are done. It's also about um, the programme over the long term and what maintenance is going to happen and, and how are you going to get that across to, to residents because that will be something sort of a, a above and beyond what 
Mears is is uh, looking to do or um, as part of their contract. And and the second thing is um, uh, options three with the, the the hybrid sort of option. When I had had a look over, over that, I can see the the disadvantages laid out fa fairly clearly there. But also, it's, it made me wonder if there would be sort of other um, behind behind this document. There must have been multiple multiple options in terms of the hybrid option because you've only set out one hybrid option as to you know which services would be retained in house and which services would be contracted out and actually there's so many multiple options of that I, I just wondered if those were explored in the background as well as just you know either staying in house or going fully um out to contractors but i, I understand from your you know previous answer the cost implications there thanks very much thank you councillor smith did you wish to take that um, yes, I, I can talk about the first bit. I think I might hand over to Pete. I understand. Sir, the difference might be possible for a hybrid model, but yeah. certainly as far as communicating with tenants goes, um, obviously we, um, we're, we're just about to send out ballot papers for the new housing engagement board, and that will be um, going forward the major way that we communicate with tenants. Um, Obviously, we've got the um, the uh, e-newsletter and um, the in-house cap in South Cam's um, web pages and so on. All the housing web pages. There's a lot of information there for tenants and and the tenants magazine that goes out twice a year. Um, but the, the housing engagement board um, will be taking over from the tenant participation group and the um, that will have six tenants on it and three members from this council. Um, so that that will be able to take more of an active role in scrutinising matters to do with with the housing policies. So uh, that that will also um, as part of that structure, there will be three area meetings. Obviously, all this was planned um, before the COVID situation where we were talking about all these meetings being actually in person and there was a criticism that people found it difficult to come to tenant participation group meetings because they were they were you know in one place usually at water beach which was a long way to come to from balsham or gamlingay yeah. um, so what what has happened is we've divided south camps into three areas and um, there will be two representatives on the housing engagement board from each of those three areas. So it's effectively making three wards out of South Cams for the election to this board. And, and then there will be local area meetings as well. Now, obviously, if people can participate online, it doesn't matter where you are. Um, so that's been rather overtaken by events, but hopefully they will get back to uh, to meeting in person and then it will actually be much better because people will have less far to travel and there will be local meetings in each of those three areas um, closer to where people live. Um, then you, you also asked about planned maintenance. Um, somewhere in the benchmarking, it does show the list of um, the decent home standard, the things that we that we the major things that we do uh, replace on us on a, uh, a cyclical basis. So that's the kitchens and bathrooms I was speaking about. We also sometimes replace roofs, which always seems a bit bonkers to me. I mean, they say a roof has a, a 50 year life lifespan. Um, so there are roofs which have been replaced in my village, but whether they whether they were really no longer fit for purpose, I'm not sure. I suppose you have to look and see if they start leaking. Um, I don't think anybody else replaces their roofs apart from councils, actually. But, uh, but there, there is a given lifespan for each of these things and, and they are replaced on, on a regular basis. Um, a 15, 15 or 20 years for a kitchen actually, you know, uh, seems quite a short time if you're in the house for that period yourself. Um, if the house has changed hands three or four times in that period, then it's a different thing, I think. So, um, but some of these are laid down by legislation and, and we have to uh, comply with them for the decent home standard. Anyway, um, yes, perhaps Peter would like to speak about the other matter, about the hybrid. 
option. Yeah, can just fill in, and there's some extra bits in communication as well, yeah. which I think, I think are relevant. Yeah. Okay. Um, remember that this this um, report is is, is uh, about the um, uh, uh, repairs, um, and it, it's a, a a midpoint report. It's it has certainly been our intention to address communication and what and what tenants want from communication through the development of the of the next stage and included in the in the tender process. But we thought it was important not to be too prescriptive at, at this stage uh, and actually seek the, view, the views of, of members, uh, of, of, of members and, and members of the public. Um, there's also, as, as um, uh, Councillor Smith mentioned, there's also a, an asset management strategy which is currently being developed. And there are a whole swathes of information there about um, um, improving information. Uh, and involving um, residents in, in, in standard settings. So it, it's rolled up in, in, into, into both documents. Um, coming on to the hybrid model, um, uh, Richard Medley, who, who wrote, uh, who's the uh, author of the main uh, art report, um, he decided which, which, which models um, uh, to use. And to his credit, he, he's been and scanned the uh, the environment and look what what um, works well in other areas of the country, uh, and he's taken um, some best practice models. So you know we're actually compared with something that's a challenge, rather than just taking one that that, 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 that suits us. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, um, Councillor Delacy. Councillor Douglas yeah. Delacy, please. Thank you, Chairman. I'm afraid this may come over as simply carping criticism, uh, but I think there is a real point behind this. May I refer um, Peter and Hazel to pages 84 and 85 on the um, or of the agenda, please? We say we're green to the core. Um, we appear to have moved to being blue to the core, and there is a huge amount of absolutely absolutely wasted colour in yes. this report, yeah. which achieves nothing. And I, I think we ought to say to people when we are going to um, commission reports like this, we do not want glossy colour that is just wasteful on the Earth's resources. We just want the data. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, and if you look at page 85, I'm astounded that a company which is supposed to be a highly professional organisation produces an almost unreadable font. Uh, and, and these two pages together really got my goat. Uh, and I hope that in future, when we commission work, we'll be able to do something better than this. Thank you, Chairman. Your point is well made. And I'm, I find the word client and contract, words client and contractor, very difficult to believe. One is C liant and the other is C on tractor. So there we are. Thank you for your point, Dr. De Lacey. Uh, Councillor Richard Williams, please. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, and um, thank you to, to Councillor Smith and, um, and Mr. Campbell for the for the presentations. Um, I I had to. Um, I mean, I'm broadly happy with the recommendation that we stick with a um, external provider. Um, but with a better contract, um, and obviously that, that, that that's a really important thing. I mean, my my well, I I had one question. I've got a follow-on question actually from from something uh, Mr. Campbell said. But um, my, my first point was just how to what extent are we going to do the internal work? I think that's necessary to make sure that the the new contract with these increased you know performance measures actually address the problems that we've got with the service i mean if you know looking at page 28 29 of the agenda there are there are clear problems the residents feel um and i think other members have mentioned that too so i think if we're going for a new contract we really want to think about how we can have terms that will address the the concerns that residents have um i mean also some of the benchmarking this is more of a cost thing but you know on pages 74 75 um we are quite high on a number of these benchmarks so whether that's something that can be resolved through the, you know, the, the, the retendering process, obviously, presumably we'll, we'll be looking at that as well. Um, the second point I, I had, though, was something that Peter, Peter Campbell mentioned, and, and he mentioned that um, we hadn't necessarily always handled the, con the, the relationship with me as very well. Um, 
So I, I was just wondering why, in, in what ways we've not handled the, the relationship well and, and, and the ways we can address that going forward. Thanks very much. Councillor Smith, were you going to... Well, I, I, I'd like to speak about the cost per repair on okay. 74 and 75. I, I think from memory, I think these figures were much more... Um, were much lower before we had the price per property thing. I'm not certain about this, but maybe maybe Peter can advise. But I think we now have fewer visits to people because that was the idea of this um, review that came four years ago when um, we brought in price per property, which meant that if um, you know I could, we have um, multi-skilled operatives going there. If they go to fix a toilet and they see a dripping tap, they'll fix that as well. You know, it's, it's that sort of thing. Make sure you don't have to go back again. And um, that, um, that that might have changed um, after that. But of course, I haven't got the figures in front of me from, from way back then um, because we weren't with this same benchmarking um, outfit. So we didn't have that same data to compare it to. But um, for the others, can I hand over to Peter? Because I think he's um, more au fait with what's uh, what's going into the new contract. Yes, of course. Peter. Um, yeah, happy to answer. Some of it is the same to, as the uh, as a previous question asked by uh, Councillor Cohn, is that there's uh, an intention between now and issuing the contract to work with groups of residents to, to determine what's important uh, uh, to them, um, what sort of priorities that, that we should give to, um, uh, to, to various classes of repairs, uh, what timescales will, uh, will be involved, uh, involved, and making sure that what we put within the tender um, meet, uh, is, is among the best in class. There is no intention to go to go out with a with their poor contract, um, and the, the, you know, and again, it would be uh, also linked to the uh, emerging asset management strategy. Um, the point about um, uh, cost, which Councillor Smith uh, has covered, um, is partly to do with the um, move to price for property uh, and the. Uh, um, importance of right first time. You know, we live in uh, a rural uh, district. We've got the house, uh, houses spread out uh, across the district. Uh, and unless we give that sort of flexibility um, to the operatives to, to fix what's right to the property, we'll end up paying people to be van drivers rather than plumbers and electricians. It's quite right that they that they try and address as many issues at once uh, uh, whilst in the, uh, in, in the property. Uh, and the third point uh, about challenges is that from what I understand, the, um, the, the contract with Mears started off well. It was, me it, it was meeting uh, our, our needs, um, but it was a contract with which we got comfortable. And what we failed to do is to uh, compare, uh, assume that, 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 that comfortable and their steady state was acceptable. Whereas elsewhere in industry, standards have, uh, have, been, uh, have been improving. Uh, and what we want from a contractor um, it it would be increasing. So what we've ended up with is a contract which looks 10 years out of date. So what we want to do is to make sure that we are understand what, what the best offer is uh, elsewhere in the market uh, and adapt our tender to, uh, to meet that and also ensure that we um, uh, have a, a programme of continuous improvement and benchmarking um, through the, the time the contracts on offer. Can I just come, come back for a quick supplementary, Chair? If it's brief, Councillor. Yeah. It, thank you. Yeah, just just a quick one. I mean, on, on that first point, um, yeah, yeah th thanks for that. But I mean, obviously, I think it's important to talk to residents and find out what they want for the future. But I was more thinking about looking back and investigating why there's this perception that the service is not working, finding out what ro went wrong in the past, and 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 using that to to you know take things forward and improve as well, rather than just you know a discussion of what you want. See what I mean? 
Point taken exactly. I think that, that is as important. Yeah, capture that. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Bradnam. Councillor Bradnam. Councillors, we've got I've got five or six more speakers to come. So yeah, could I ask worry. you all, all to be brief as possible, please? Absolutely. Uh, I agree, Chairman. Um, I just wanted to ask if we um, encounter uh, a council housing that we have recently inherited from developers, you know, as part of their affordable housing provision, and we find quite soon in that um, in our ownership of those properties that they've got um, quite significant problems. How do we um, do we have any redress back to the developers? You know, if, for example, they're damp or uh, they leak or, or are noisy or whatever. Um, and and the other one is, is this if, part of this contract? Well, it, it's the it's the Mears contract that would have to be coming back over and over and over again to the same property. Do you see what I mean? Yes. So, uh, and I just wondered if we identify properties that do have major problems, what do we do? Do we divest ourselves of those properties, or do we continue to pay Mears to go and do the repairs? Thank you. Shall I start on that me, one? If you would please, Hazel. Yes, um, I think I think um, I know something of the background to some of this, but um, yes, it, um, on section 106 properties, obviously we wouldn't know necessarily if Mears went back several times to, to a particular repair, um, if it was within the price per property. And that's something which um, has come out at the housing board meetings um, when tenants have told us that that sort of thing's been going on and actually um, there was no mechanism for Mears to feed that information back because the KPI wasn't there and we, we are asking for better KPIs this time so that is part of that um, but um, yes I, I must say I've asked the question if, if a house starts um, misbehaving if you get damp um, because something isn't working after, you know, only a couple of years after the house is new, what redress do we have from the builder? And I've asked, you know, do they have NHBC guarantees? Can we actually go back to the builder in yeah. that case? Um, but I don't know whether Peter's got the answer to that. Peter, over to you. There are three parts to this answer, really. Um, Firstly, uh, most new properties come with a defect liability period where, where, where during that time uh, responsibility for um, defined repairs uh, will should be met by the, by the uh, developer. Uh, that is mainly, mainly uh, uh, major pieces of work. Wouldn't include things like plaster pops that, that you often get in a new house. Secondly, I think that we have, uh, and I need to double check this, um, that we would uh, retain some, um, the, the final payments for the properties uh, until the end of the uh, of defect liability period. Uh, and thirdly, uh, more generally, and to do with properties that are generally in bad condition, uh, rather new properties in bad condition, the asset management strategy uh, uh, contains specific guidance on, on what we, what, how we would cope with properties that were in such a bad state of repair um, that they would be uh, un uneconomical. Thank you. Thank you very much. Judith, who's next? Um, it's me, but oh. I have had my questions answered. So the next person yes. is Councillor Peter Fain. Peter. Thank you, Chair. Yes, the report um, assesses two options and jumps uh, from the DLO option, as I will call it, to a conclusion that um, in cost terms, there's not a material difference between the two main options, but there are big setup costs if we were to go back to a DLO arrangement. My concern is that when repairs are reported, they go to a manager who looks at delivery of the contract and cost effectiveness of the way in which those repairs are delivered. And there is a problem with minor repairs, particularly in our sheltered housing. Sometimes 
officers involved who who are meeting the tenants, sometimes vulnerable tenants, or were meeting them quite regularly, now talking to them obviously in a different way, um, have to keep going back. I'm sorry, I've reported that again. I've just this afternoon had confirmation that a, a shower for an elderly resident, it sounds like a very simple repair, that shower has not been functioning for over six months now. And the officer who uh, is trying to get that repaired is clearly tearing her hair out. Uh, she says it's disgraceful, but I can't do anything about it. Now that would not happen if, uh, in most cases, if we had a small DLO operation, at least in relation to the, the most vulnerable tenants. I know that sometimes officers would love to be free to do a quick repair themselves, but of course they can't. Um, and yet sometimes these are not very skilled operations, I suspect. I haven't been able to go in and inspect it myself, but the repair of that shower would not be complicated. Often uh, fixing, repairing fixings that might otherwise fall down and become more expensive to repair can be done very quickly by a small DLO operation. And I think therefore that it is worth considering the hybrid model. And I'm largely following what uh, other councillors have said um, this afternoon. I do think it is worth having uh, the scope to do some repairs ourselves in order to ensure that the not only is the, the service maintained, but the relationship between our, our own officers in the sheltered housing is not constantly undermined because their credibility is reduced by being unable to control when those repairs are done. If we had a system whereby we could get minor repairs done quickly, I'm not talking about anything particularly high skilled, some plumbing skills, some carpentry skills, then I think that could be more cost effective and would offer a better service to our vulnerable tenants in many cases. Thank you, Peter. Hazel, did you wish to comment on that? Um, can I can I back that one over to Peter? Yes, good. Peter. <laughs> yeah. Can, can I just? There are a couple of things there. Uh, um, firstly, uh, the point about about um, multiple um, visits. And this, look, let's be clear. The situation you described about about that shower is, is unacceptable, and that would be unacceptable whoever was was providing the repair service. Um, second point is that you you make the point about um, multiple visits, uh, and that is exactly the sort of um, uh, behaviour that a price per property contract is intended to 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 design out. Um, it's yeah, as we've mentioned in previous questions, a lot of the cost of providing a repair service within our district is, is, is one of travel. Um, and you know, it, it, it is unlike a traditional contract which pays um, you know, per, per, per job, actually attending uh, multiple times to sort the same problem is in effect penal penalising the, um, uh, the contractor. But then moving on to your final point about um, services for um, in sheltered housing. Thinking this through, there would be no reason that I can think of why we couldn't uh, include something in any contract which required a regular handyman type service and visit from whoever contractor, if it's in-house or, or external, to, to attend a sheltered housing scheme on a on, on a regular basis with the authorization to carry out any repairs that identify identified during that during that visit and that's you know if that's successful that's something that I'm more than willing to explore with the um, uh, with, with the consultants to include with, with, within the contract that's a very good suggestion Peter I, can, I, I scribbled down a few notes here of things that we might wish to add as recommendations at the end. I've just added that to it. I think that's an extremely valid point. Thank you. Uh, Judith, who's next, please? And we have Councillor Claire Daunton and then finally Councillor Jeff Harvey. Claire, over to yes. you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think, uh, PT, when you were um, giving your presentation earlier, you mentioned that the, the contract with Mears was had become too cosy or was cosy. Um, so presumably in um, 
taking out a new contract, whatever, whichever way you go, whether it is with an external contractor that replace it, who replaces Mears, um, presumably that would you would want that to be much more professional, much tougher and more professional. But then do you feel then that you need to improve uh, the internal toughness and professionalism? Do you think that that needs to be balanced both sides? Hazel, over to you. I saw you Absolutely know. essential. Yes, yes. Well, I Sorry. know, I know <laughs> Peter's, Peter's, um, Peter's got a post to fill in that role. And um, so I'll, I'll pass over to Peter. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yes, Heather does. Absolutely essential that, 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 that we are uh, um, that, that we are tougher, um, and that, that applies to um, uh, my officers. It also um, uh, applies to the information that we provide to uh, tenants and, and members, um, to uh, and giving them, you know, given people outside the departments the ability to um, uh, uh, scrutinise the, the performance of the uh, uh, of the contractors. And let's be blunt, this is not just something that we are saying. This is now a requirement uh, within the, uh, um, the housing white paper. Uh, we've got to give tenants more control o o over uh, their environment and their properties. OK, um, can I just quickly follow? Actually, I'm really glad that you mentioned that because I was going to say that one of the things that will be embedded in the new contract, presumably, is everything that follows from Grenfell um and housing um fire precaution and all, all the new tougher measures that have come out as a result of Grenfell and um social the impact on social housing uh, not so much uh, within within the this contract but it's very strong within the, the emerging asset management strategy uh, and we we've listed um all the at-risk items so electric gas water safety uh fire risk assessments and another one I can't remember, <laughs> but it, it, it's yes. all in there. Uh, and, and what we're saying, we want, we want strong performance information um, there uh, with an identified officer. Uh, and you will see later on the agenda, we're looking at the, um, uh, at the business case for the council. Uh, and there's a suggestion within there that, that it, this is so important that we make um, uh, monitoring and compliance a corporate target so it's more open rather than something that's just, 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 just hidden within the uh, housing contract. Thank you, that's very good, thank you. Thank you very much. And so we come to Councillor Jeff Harvey, our final speaker. Yes, um, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I just wanted to um, uh, sort of support some of the things that um, Councillor Cathcart said right at the beginning. I, I suppose, um, we're working from the assumption that the, the in-house option and, and the hybrid uh, option are in there because they are realistic options to go for rather than to be just um, kind of options that we reject in favour of uh, renewing a contract. Um, I suppose the reason why the running cost um, for an in-house um, operation are slightly higher, I mean, would I be correct? Part of that is is sort of, for example, uh, the pensions overhead. So, so you can't really compare sort of those two jobs because one I think probably has better conditions of employment than the other and the, the difference partly made up by sort of paying shareholders and I think um, sort of the experience with things like you know private finance initiative and you know um, uh, kind of um, putting things out uh, at, um, you know out out to uh, private contracts is sort of I, I feel it's almost um, uh, Perhaps time that pendulum began to swing back the other way. Um, the, the other, I suppose, um, like I said, I'm, I'm sure you've considered is that uh, obviously we've invested in South Camps Hall, you know, we've got Water Beach. I, I mean, um, uh, as, as time goes by, we would we probably quite like to have people to fill that space uh, and make use of it. Um, as we find sort of uh, desk based workers are more and more uh, working from home, might actually be quite. Um, well, it effectively reduce that cost if we if we could use some of that space for a sort of physically based uh, operations. Thank you. Um, Councillor Smith, did you want to come back on that? Um, yeah, yes, I can come back on that. I mean, at the moment, the um, the Mears operation is is run from next to Travis Perkins in Cottenham, um, which is very convenient. Um, 
so um, he's wondering when I'm going to make his tea. <laughs> um, yes, they, they are operating from next to Travis Perkins in Cottenham. Um, obviously, um, it would be for a new contractor to to find premises. And in fact, um, we could we could um, get an income from using part of South Camps Hall for that, whether or not it was an in-house operation. Indeed. Thank you. Well, um, please, we've, we've come to the end of our speakers and we're asked to, under our recommendations to firstly take note of the progress on the project to date support the retendering of the repair service and make our comments and suggestions and among those I have noted here that we believe that sustainability should be an integral part of the contract yeah. that the concerns of residents uh, should be noted and the communication systems that we've put in place will continue and hopefully improve and um, that any potential improvement possibility should be integrated into the contract and that the contract ought also to include a handyman service for uh, minor repairs. Is everyone content with those comments and suggestions and that therefore we take note of the uh, the housing repair um, contract? Chair, can, I, can I come in please chair? Um, yep. There was the handyman service for the sheltered housing so for oh. the more vulnerable residents I wasn't going to limit it to that, so I was just going to okay. say a demand service. Chairman, I just yes. wanted to ask one. Um, Very quickly, please. Well, it was, didn't, did we not also include the um, option that if um, a new housing was found to be defective, um, that we, we did pursue it through the developer, um, through the builder? Well, that I'm happens assuming. anyway. Okay. I'm assuming right, that we would automatically do that as a as a responsible organisation. Uh, so, <laughs> subject to those comments, is everyone content that we um, note this report and move on? Can I, sorry, can I just um, come in briefly? I, I think yes. Yeah. Nigel, please. Yeah, no, I, I agree. It's just that the point was touched on. I think I mentioned one or two members touched on about the uh, the in-house option. I look, I totally agree on the, the arguments for going out to tender, but it's just for not to be lost sight of in the process in case circumstances change and we sort of that's, I'm, I'm probably a minority viewer here. <laughs> um, well, I, I, <laughs> Councillor Smith and the, and the uh, Head of Housing have, have heard the comments and I'm sure that they will give consideration to it. I think that's all I'm asking for, not that it's actually um, uh, put forward as a as a as the as a view of the committee, but just um, the, the advantages of the in-house service are not lost sight of. That's all I'm trying to say. Um, Indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, <laughs> can I can I thank Councillor Hazel Smith and Peter Campbell for your contributions? We put you on the spot a little bit tonight, but thank you very much for your very detailed responses. The most helpful. Thank, thank you. Thank you. And I hope you enjoy your dinner. <laughs> uh, and that Mr Smith does too. <laughs> Let us move on to agenda item seven, which is the review of the business plan. And I'm delighted that we have uh, Councillor Neil Goff with us to present. And it is included on the supplementary pages that you have. Uh, so Neil, over to you. OK, thank you, Chair. I'll try and be uh, very, um, very brief and just say a couple of introductory um, comments about this. Um, obviously, the, the business plan is an important document, um, but it doesn't reflect everything which the council does, because a lot of the, what the council does falls into the, the sort of business as usual category, um, things like planning applications and so forth, and some very important business as usual, like the, the local plan. And much of that is monitored in a different way by your committee um, in terms of business as usual through KPIs and other measures and so forth. But what the business plan does is try to focus on some key deliverables um, in the year ahead and um, highlight uh, particular things which this council wants to wants to achieve. And um, this is 
now, I think, um, a, a, a familiar format to you. Um, and and it's a familiar format because there's you know a lot of continuity uh, in terms of the priorities uh, which this council has, and those key four priorities remain the same. Um, so there's a lot of continuity in the business plan, but we also have to recognise that this has been a year of discontinuity, and so there are there are two particular areas in this plan, I think, which have got greater weight. Um, in terms of our consideration this year. One is, is around um, support for business, um, including recovery of business, the, the green dimension, and the other is support for um, communities in the COVID recovery, both of which have been recognised um, with new cabinet positions and, uh, and resources uh, in the budget and um, in the, the formation of the, the, the new posts in cabinet. Um, so how is this how is this report structured? Essentially, um, what it does is it goes through the four priority areas. It it picks out um, the key the key actions and the key priorities for uh, the fourth the forthcoming year. Um, and each one of those has a commitment associated with it, a deliverable, which is defined by um, the quarters. And um, we also have um, at the at the bottom of each section highlighted those uh, actions and achievements which were really completed in the past year, and those have been those essentially sort of drop out of the drop out of the plan. Um, is actions completed? So what's in the table is focused very much on the forthcoming year. And I've just noticed that. Uh, um, on some of the tables on B, it's 2021 priorities. That, of course, everything in the table shows 21, 22 priorities. So um, I thank the officers for all their hard work. This is a this is a you know a culmination of all of the input across all of the activities um, in the council, and Anne has kind of spearheaded that and and uh, acted as a bit of a quarterback with it. But it reflects a lot of input from a lot of people. Thank you. We can't hear you, Chair. I've, I've put it onto mute in case there was any background noise and the phone rang. Um, so yeah. I think we have Councillor Bradnam, yeah. Councillor Anna Bradnam. Mm -hmm. Looks like looks like the only speaker. Yes, thank you. And um, I just wanted to say thank you very much. This is a very useful summary. Um, and my only um, request is a matter of formatting, which is that I find the format confusing because as uh, Councillor Goff has said, for each of the sections, there's a title which he's identified confusingly had this current year's um, uh, years on it instead of the, for the forward looking year, the priorities for the forward plan so that was slightly confusing but also can I just simply suggest that the actions and achievements completed from the 2021 business plan should be at the beginning of each section then looking at the priorities going forward with the ongoing objectives and then the priorities so it sort of flows in chronological order I would just find that a much simpler way of looking at it so, so it's simply a question of formatting please Thank you. I'm sure Anne will take that away for the future. <laughs> thank uh, you. Councillor Daunton. Yeah, yeah, thank you very, thank you, Chairman. Um, thank you very much uh, for the report, which I found very um, easy to to assimilate the information. So it's very well um, set out and very comprehensive. I've just got two small points. Uh, one very small point, which is on page nine under ongoing objectives. Um, we're now a community safety partnership, not a crime and disorder reduction partnership. That's the old name. So maybe that could be updated to the CSP. Um, and then um, uh, more important, I was looking for um, where, where you've um, scheduled in the work on health and well-being. Where can I find that? I think that was on, if I remember, it's in point 
think that's an area B, isn't it? Well, yes. uh, I, I, I thought you might... Objectives, uh, footnote, note four, um, on page 12. This is, this is, this is a little bit where we get, we get caught in our, in the trap of our own continuity. Um, by, by wanting to sort of put things under four, four headings um, and also sort of keep them as specific, uh, you know, deliverables. And I think sort of that the whole health and well-being ed, ed, agenda, you know, does have elements which are in it in section section B, but it does also really significantly fall under the ongoing objectives under B rather okay. than the specific deliverables in the table. OK, so I, I was looking basically, um, I was looking in the wrong place. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I think we're looking, Thank you. We're looking the right, the right, I guess, I guess the difficulty with, with something like health and well-being is that it's very difficult to translate it into a sort of specific deliverable yeah. with a specific timetable. It really is ongoing activities and, um, and that's why it sort of flips down to the ongoing objectives. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm just going. To, I've got one more. I'm just going to take one more speaker. I'm afraid we need to move on. So, Chair Sarah Chung Johnson, and then we must bring this to an end. Sarah. Um, thank you. Yeah, thanks. I'll just echo my thanks for this really clear business plan. I just wanted to, on page 11, uh, where we've got community forums mentioned as part of the housing that is truly affordable uh, priority. Um, could I see some? Um, what would be good, I think, is if, if we have uh, kind of some forums internally for lessons learned, because obviously we're going through a lot in North Stowe at the moment. And I would like to think that some of the, 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 the things that are causing us trouble now could be fed back so that they aren't, you know, future problems for other new developments that are coming on. And I don't I think we lack that kind of internal feedback loop to so it's not just community forums but it's other things that have tripped us up or we have found difficult that, that it would be good for us to capture those uh, and ensure for all of the new towns that we're building that we can can kind of learn from those lessons yeah, yeah. I, I think that's good for, oh sorry <laughs> no you go ahead okay, yeah. okay. I, I think that's an excellent idea and um we have obviously started these liaison meetings and we have existing forums which have been operating and um, some of them are going really well and some probably are not going less well so what I will take as an action is to talk to Jeff Membry about pooling you know what we think are the the key key things which are which we're doing well and why they're going well and seeing if we can sort of replicate across um, uh, all these all these groups and forums. Um, you know, this is this is one area where um, this is a journey, and we've started some, and we probably will start some others. But uh, we also need to make sure that the ones we've started are operating as best as they yeah. can. And I think, sorry, my point was also just on the wider remit of just community development, as well as you know other areas that we're looking at, and so not just just isolated to community forums. And some of the, the, the wide lessons. Yeah. Thanks. I support I, that, Chairman, please. Yes, indeed. Um, and I think that, that I'm going to wind this up now. So uh, I'm going to say to Councillor de Goff and to Anne, thank you so much for what is an excellent report. And a report that, uh, amongst all the reports that we have tonight, exit, um, drew not a single question in the pre meet last night. So there is broad satisfaction and support. And I thank you both very much for the hard work that's gone behind it. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Chair. Very much indeed. So we move on to agenda item eight, which is the uh, report from the task and finish group, uh, which was responsible for looking at our COVID-19 response. Um, you have the report that we there are two minor, two minor but important amendments to the recommendations which have been circulated so far. At recommendation one will now read the council should host appreciation events plural to celebrate the success of the community response and to acknowledge the work of community groups volunteers and local members during the covid19 pandemic so that's a change in that and in recommendation two um 
that we, sh we our recommendation to is is the um, appreciation events which I've dealt with. Um, in sorry, that, so that was the change for recommendation two. For recommendation one, um, in terms of supporting groups going forward, uh, we would recommend that uh, any applications for funding should be made through the grants committee who would uh, monitor and review uh, any grants that are required to sustain the groups going forward. The reason for that is if you look at the um, the detail responses in Appendix B of the groups which have carried out some unbelievable work during these months. Um, perhaps listening to them was almost the most humbling moment that I have experienced uh, as a district councillor. The amount of work that the uh, volunteers, led often by uh, local members, has been quite extraordinary and we would very much like to see that continue. Now, in order to do that, they're clearly going to need some seed funding. Uh, and we believe that there is an opportunity to provide that. And following on from our last meeting, I wrote uh, to Councillor John Williams, Head of Finance, uh, seeking his support for grants to be available. And I'm delighted that I re received a report a couple of days ago um, in which John confirms that he wanted to wait the approval of the 2021-22 budget before replying. Uh, he went on to say that the budget provides for a contingency fund of £250,000 and we also have what remains of the £50,000 COVID-19 fund we set up this year and grants may agree this Friday to amend the community chest rules to permit community groups and parish councils to apply for to apply to it for funding up to £2,000 for mitigating the effects of the pandemic for a limited period. So I think we have a mechanism in place to ensure the, the funding uh, and I would therefore ask that the committee support this, but in doing so to thank Jay Clark who is with us now uh, and also Cecilia Murphy Rhodes, both of them have done the most incredible job in supporting our volunteer groups through this very difficult year. Um, you will you will all have seen, I think, uh, the two briefing notes that were sent out, which provide uh, a tremendous amount of information on where member where community groups can go for help and information. Uh, even in some cases, sending them as far as Scandinavia to get advice. Really wonderful stuff that's been put together. So to Jay and to Cecilia, I'd like to record my most sincere thanks. But also to uh, my colleagues on the Task and Finish group, Claire Daunton, Joe Sales and Judith Rippeth, who worked incredibly hard uh, to bring this report forward and to hopefully highlight the uh, outstanding work that has been done. And I've asked that when we get to the end of this, the information relating to the work that's been done uh, should be circulated to our county councillor and member, members of parliament so that they are fully aware too of just how much good work has been done uh, by the volunteers within, within our district. Uh, does anyone have any questions? No speakers. Are you therefore minded to accept the modified re recommendations as I have uh, laid them out? Agreed. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Oh, it's been this has been an absolute delight to work with you all on such an exciting and interesting project. And we come we come now to another one, agenda item nine, and I'm going to invite. Um, Councillor Sarah Chung Johnson, who led this uh, task and finish group to uh, recommend her report. Uh, but just before I do, can I thank Sarah and the team again, Dave Daunton, Jeff Harvey and Richard Williams for your incredible contributions to what I think is an extremely valuable document. So 
Sarah, thank you to you and your team and over to you. Thank you. I will keep this brief because I know uh, that our meeting is, is running on. Um, as you can see, there are several recommendations uh, from the report. A lot of them actually come from really good work that the city's doing that I think we need to emulate. Um, they have a dedicated officer. Uh, they have their equalities policy and some of these measures already embedded in various different business streams throughout the council. And I really think that it would benefit um, the um, people who will look at this for us to have some um, meetings with the city to, to, to look at how they do it, but also to join forces with them, especially on some of the um, outreach items uh, to other communities, because obviously um, our communities are, are shared across. I mean, people don't 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 just stick to to being in South Cams uh, to, to go and attend community events, for example. So um, hopefully um, the recommendations are pretty uh, straightforward, but obviously if you've got any questions, do bring them up. Um, I would just like to take the opportunity to thank uh, Victoria Wallace for supporting us, um, for the my fellow uh, council members of the Task and Finish group, and also to Susan Gardner-Craig and her HR colleagues for all of the time that gave to us um, in answering our very many questions on HR and how uh, our recruitment process etc works um, but I think the main point I think we'd like to make from the from this report is that obviously this is not a closed ended task and we really want to see a lot of this work embedded in the work that we're doing in the council and to that end the, the recommendations hopefully support that so that we can begin to see some of this work take fruition in, in all the other areas that we scrutinize. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I I see no speakers, so I presume that means once again everyone is in a similar mind to mine and that we should simply give uh, Claire and, uh, Sarah and her colleagues uh, total support and thank them very much for the project. Yes, sorry. Sorry, Chairman, uh, apologies. There was just one um, comment that we made which was in recommendation one absolutely lovely report but in recommendation one we just said the authors might want to just look at the wording of recommendation one because it, it's slightly ambiguous and it might imply to somebody reading it that you meant something other than what you intended so it um where it says key performance indicators relating to BAME employees I'm not sure that's quite what you meant. I think you might have meant that it was key performance indicators into how the council responds to BAME employees rather than yeah. what they're doing. It sounds as if we're monitoring them, whereas actually I think we're monitoring what the council is doing with regard to BAME employees. If I've yes. misunderstood. Yeah. No, you're right. You're right, Councillor Bradman. Yes. So you might want to just reword that recommendation. Thank you. Uh, Thank the leader you. would like to come in. So uh, Bridget, over to you. Uh, only to say thank you very much indeed. I don't imagine this was an easy piece of work to do. Um, and I think it's been turned around in a, in a surprisingly short time frame. It's a really high quality piece of work, which as a, as a council, I think we should be really proud of. So um, many thanks to everybody concerned, because I know that you've put your, your heart and souls into this, and it's much appreciated. Yeah, well done. Thank you. Thank you, Leader. Uh, so we now come to item 10 on the agenda, which is our work programme. Uh, I ought to tell you that we had a triangulation meeting with the leader and uh, two the two deputy leaders and chief executive yesterday. Uh, we have some thoughts going forward on what we the work that we might wish to pick up in future, but we're going to take a, a short break because whilst we just determine exactly what which areas we tend to focus on for our task and finish groups um, because I think with the staff are absolutely worn out at the moment we need to give them a bit of a break so uh, Judith and I will speak in the coming days and we will look at uh, with in conjunction with the lead members uh, particular areas that we might wish to focus on uh, but other than that, I think it's fair to say that the work programme is as as you see uh, and of course will be subject to, to change as uh, the documents and papers come forward. Chairman, uh, yes. there is just one other element and this this work programme is uh, needs to also have its date updated. Oh, it says 2020 to 21 and it should be 21 to 22. 
Yeah, indeed. That that seems to be a, a theme <laughs> that's running through. And I'm sure that before it gets to Cabinet, all those dates will change. Lovely, thanks. Are there any other points on the work programme? No? no, thank you very much. In that case, can I uh, just inform you that our next meeting will take place on Thursday, the 18th of March 2021 at 5.20pm. And can I thank you all very much for your contributions this evening. My thanks to the DEM services team for providing the network. Thanks to all the pre presenters uh, and thanks to uh, both committee members and league members who have joined us this evening and made their contributions uh, so helpful. So thank you very much to everyone. Have a safe journey home and I look forward to seeing you very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks very much.